So uh, did somebody say a little bit earlier that we need a source of more reliable water? Yes, sort of thought that. Is the vast Pacific Ocean reliable enough? Not so fast, say some. In our recent session entitled Ocean Desalination Moving in the Right Direction, question mark, you'll get to hear about real case studies of successful and not so successful projects and about two projects right here in our own backyard that are very cool. The session will first begin with a brief presentation by our session moderator, Tom Pankratz. Um, Tom, you're already up here, so thank you. I'll uh, give you a little bit of bio. Uh, Tom Pratt, Pan Pankratz, thank you, is editor of the Global Water Intelligence Weekly Water Desalination Report and has been involved in the desal industry since 1979. He has participated in the development of some of the world's largest and most technically complex desal projects and has been co-chairman of the WHO Desalination Technolo Technology Institute, our committee, thank you, a member of the Middle East Desalination Research Center's Research Advisory Committee, and a past member of the National Academy of Sciences Desalination Roadmap Review Committee. Through his career, Tom focused sh from, has shifted from seawater intakes to RO systems, to pretreatment systems, to thermal systems, and back to RO and he has completed expat assignments in Dubai and Paris. He is based in Houston, Texas, where it also just recently rained. So please join me in welcoming Tom Pancrest to the stage. Take it away, Tom. Thank you. Great to meet you. <clears throat> uh, and, and for the record, I'm a first-generation desalter. Uh, I, our youngest son is also following my footsteps, and just coincidentally, our, our oldest grandson, who lives in, uh, in Northern California, was doing something for school a couple of weeks ago, and he called me up and said, do I need a chemical engineering degree if I want to be a desalter? Because I'm doing something for a, for a uh, career day. So we're, we're a long way from the, the farmers, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, anyway, first of all, good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the, uh, the Orange County organizers for inviting me to speak today. And during my presentation, we're going to look at some of the marquee desalination initiatives and some of the big projects around the, uh, the world. And it's going to be a whirlwind tour because, you know, I, I could speak for uh, the rest of the morning on each one of the projects that we're going to cover. But we we'll try to give you a little bit of glimpse of what's going on in seawater desalination around the rest of the world. And we're going to start in the Caribbean. Now, when people think about seawater desal, they usually think about the Middle East, but the Caribbean really has a longer desal tradition. They've been, uh, they've been desalting for 85 years, for more than 85 years, and it's, uh, although most of that time they've relied on distillation, the distillation technology that they use have many of the same environmental and technical issues that we face with RO today. Uh, the, as we'll see here, the uh, technology is certainly shifting away from dis distillation to membrane technologies, but they face intake-related problems, brine discharges, you know, they're, they're relying on a, uh, a tourist industry that spends a lot of time in the water diving and snorkeling, so they want to make sure they don't damage the coral reefs, they want to make sure that there's a lot of marine life out there, and it's, uh, it's been a big issue for them. Uh, we're we're going to start in Curacao. This is where the first uh, commercial municipal desalination plant was built in 1929. Since then, we've tracked over 300 desalination projects throughout the Caribbean. There are also, I'd imagine, probably double that number for small hotels and small resorts that they're too small to, to really make our radar. But uh, it's, we've been keeping, in, incidentally, this inventory since 1960, so 300 plants that we've tracked in the Caribbean since, uh, since 1960. In fact, the first seawater RO system, a commercial seawater RO system, was installed in uh, Bermuda in 1974. Uh, but I'm going to spend a couple minutes on Aruba. And Aruba was, uh, it, it put its first plant in uh, 84 years ago, and it's relied for most of the, uh, until just recently, on distillation. In fact, it was so important to the, uh, to the island that uh, they put a stamp out commemorating the, uh, the distillers. 
This is what most of the distillers look like. In fact, these were furnished. They had seven of these things that were operating side by side between 1990 and about 2001. They've been installed. But in 2005, one of the utility uh, engineers took a look at the, the coming RO boom that they've seen in the rest of the world and evaluated what the uh, internal rate of return would be if they would shift from thermal desal, which used steam from the power plant, to the uh, to RO system, and they found a 19% rate of return versus 7% for the, uh, the existing thermal plants. So that started the drive towards RO. This was their first RO system that they put in in 2009. It's on the same site as the, uh, as the uh, thermal plants. They're in the background here. And you see that land that's uh, at the end of that blue building. Well, they ended up putting, they ended up putting another plant there in uh, 2009. So they're, they're gradually replacing all of the thermal capacity with, with the ROs. Now we're going to move to Trinidad. It's the, one of the largest islands in the Caribbean, and although it has a, a lot of rainfall, they haven't been able to capture it, and they still found themselves in a situation where they needed additional water, particularly for the industry. There's a, there's a lot of industry in the island, uh, and so they turned to seawater desal. They installed a, a plant, actually it says 48 MGD, that is what it's pr providing today, but initially it started out at uh, 32 MGD, They've expanded it six times since 2002. It was developed as a public-private partnership, and they've made over 132 billion gallons since, uh, since the plant was installed. And a little later this year, it's going to lose the title of the biggest RO plant in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, that's going to be, uh, that torch will be passed to the Carlsbad plant. Uh, another plant we hear about a lot is the second largest plant in the Western Hemisphere, and that's the Tampa Bay plant. This plant uh, was started in 2003, but had a number of issues, uh, technical challenges and also some commercial issues that required the plant uh, to go through what amounted to a $48 million rehab that uh, and it didn't actually start producing full capacity and meet its commitments until 2007. But even with the 48 $48 million hit that it took on, uh, on bringing it up to speed, they still are able to produce water at $1,400 an acre foot. So it's a pretty competitive rate. And I checked on the plant with the general manager yesterday before coming here just to make sure that uh, th there wasn't anything I was, uh, wasn't aware of. But he said the plant this week is making about 16 MGD. It's not required at full capacity, so they're, uh, they've cut bad production, and generally it makes between 12 and 16 MGD. But he said it could be turned up to 25 tomorrow if it was required. Just shows, this is what the, the, the big issue, and we could spend the rest of the day talking about the issues with, Car with Tampa Bay, but there were issues with the pretreatment system. This is what it looked like initially. And all the red bits are those that had to be either replaced or changed or added to bring it up to speed. So there were some significant uh, technical issues that were dealt with, and as I said, the, the plan is now operating as it should. We heard a little bit about Israel today, and Israel is another, uh, another location that had very little desal until 2005. The only plant that they had was a small one in Elat at the very bottom of the screen there. But since 2005, they've, uh, they've built six large plants one, it should be online uh, next year. And when the next plant is online, the seawater desal could supply up to 80% of the water in the national grid. This is really the plant that started it all and the most famous of the lot. It's the Ashkelon plant. It's incidentally been upgraded since that 86 MGD. But it was uh, built as a public-private partnership. And even though I mentioned the, uh, the uh, Trinidad plant had some similarities. It was both a big plant and public-private partnership. This is really the plant that got the latest desal boom started. This, this plant and its success has, uh, has prompted desal to, to take off, not only in Israel, but uh, around the world. Everybody who's doing desal makes a trek there and uh, usually looks at it. But one of the interesting things about it is that it, 
we, we always hear that desal is energy intensive, and it, it is. There's no more expensive, energy intensive way to make water than with desal. And it's especially difficult when you're trying to do it in places like uh, the Caribbean, where energy is 40 cents a kilowatt hour. But in Israel, they have some similar problems. This is an energy uh, tariff, and it shows that there are, based on the time of day and the season of the year, the energy can vary from six cents a kilowatt hour up to 28 cents. And there's even a day of the week uh, chart that I didn't, didn't show on here for clarity purposes. So one of, the, one of the real challenges was how can we make as much water as possible when the energy tariffs are low, but yet not invest so much in such a big capital project that we can't afford it. So they've, they've done some clever things. Uh, you know, we heard about drip irrigation. They did, uh, I guess, the desal equivalent of drip irrigation here, and they, they optimized it, and they've done a very good job. And the, uh, the, the Ashkelon project, and for that matter, all the projects in Israel, show that you can do large-scale seawater desal reliably, produce good quality water, and uh, do it reasonably economically. This is the un another thing that, that I think is really important, uh, especially for the varied audience here, is it, people always try to quantify what are the benefits of desalination. And it's been hard to do, but in Israel, they, they, uh, because so much of their uh, water supply is now provided by desal, they started looking at it, and the Israeli Water Authority accumulated the data, and they showed, and this chart shows the uh, chlorides level and the hardness in the groundwater. And they show that once you start offloading some of your uh, pumping capacity of the aquifers to uh, desal plants, your groundwater improves rather rapidly. Uh, they, sh they show here, and they, some of these are projections, but they also put an economic value on it. And they found that by reducing the chlorides and the hardness, the water heaters lasted much longer. They had, they had to clean them less frequently. The laundry was eat cleaned, it used less detergent. Uh, dishwashing. Uh, they also found that crops, crop yields increased with more desal or with lower TDS water, and it impacted their GDP. Now, just with the improvements in water quality, they, they quantified it at $148 an acre foot. When they looked at the quantity-related impacts, they valued that at $444 an acre foot. So they, they really saw some significant impacts, positive impacts. Uh, going to desal. Another, we'll come back a little closer to home here, Santa Barbara, right up the road. This is uh, what it looked like in 1992. Uh, it was built as a result of a prolonged drought. Uh, the plant was constructed in 91, and as we know, it, as soon as it started in 92, it started to rain, and so the plant was, uh, the plant was shut down but, and, and mothballed. And you can see the RO units. They were trailer-mounted units right here. In fact, this shows the trailers. Uh, the, this, it was made up of 12 of these uh, trailer, or 12 units. Each unit had two of these trailers, one for the RO modules, the other for the pumping and ancillary equipment. And when the unit was mothballed, one of the interesting things about this plant was that five, M, five of the trailers, five of the units were shipped, that were sold off to Saudi Arabia. They were installed in, uh, in the port of Jeddah, uh, and in fact, here is a picture of the, uh, the five units. They, they've been running continuously since 2000. The membranes were replaced, uh, and, but many of the original parts are still in service. They, they've also, as they need maintenance, they update the design to better metallurgy and uh, do a, bring them up to more to today's standards. But I took this picture because I thought it was kind of interesting. The, the energy recovery devices which were then a paltry 81 to 84 percent efficient, are still being used. Today's energy recovery devices are, you know, upwards of 94, 95 percent efficient, but they, uh, they're, they're still in service there. We'll, we'll go to Australia for a moment. This is what Australia looked like, the number of seawater desal plants in 2006, before the initiative took place. Well, in 2007, you can see the, uh, the dam levels dropped precipitously low, lower than in recorded history. So they quickly developed a policy to, to put desal in. Perth was the first one to, uh, to put in desal. In fact, and we still refer to Perth as something that's very uh, analogous to what's going on in California here. And the other plants put the plants in. Now, the next, uh, the, the follow-up to this is that 
after putting in these plants, well, excuse me, let me get ahead. Here are, the, here are the plants. In fact, there's an industrial plant up in the northwest. But three of these plants, the three most east, easternmost plants, have been mothballed because, like Santa Barbara, it started to rain. Perth built that one plant in 2007. They added on in 2011, and then they added on in 2012. The rest of the, the, rest of the uh, municipalities went right off the bat with huge plants, uh, drought busters, they called them. Perth took a little bit more conservative approach, building one, if they needed it, they added on and so on. And it proved to be the, uh, the most uh, responsible way to do it because the other plants are still are, are idle. I, I was an advisor on five of the six plants and I couldn't believe they wanted to build such large plants. You know, D-cell wants, you know, it can take advantage of economies of scale. You want to build them large. Uh, they did. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to always be cheap. Not, when you put a large project, like the, the Melbourne project, for instance, that's uh, over almost three times the size of uh, Carlsbad. You put it 85 kilometers or 50 miles from the, uh, the city, then you have to pump all that water uphill you have to put it underground. They had power lines that they had to bury underground. It was expensive. Uh, in, in defense of what they've done, they certainly uh, they, they did a good job from the environmental perspective. It's their planning that I question. Um, this shows the Perth plant. This is the first plant. It, it's right next to a power plant. And it's in Coburn Sound, almost surrounded by, uh, or semi-surrounded. There was a big concern environmentally about What's it going to do to the, uh, the marine life? So they implemented uh, multi-port diffusers. It, uh, it did a good job. It's, they had some very stringent permitting requirements in that if the, the salinity or the dissolved oxygen dropped below a preset level, they had to shut the plant down and couldn't run it. it it's operated. Here's the Perth II plant, which they, they built. The first phase of it finished in 2011. The day it started, they started the second phase, or they announced the second phase. And just one other thing, that this is how you start adding up costs. This is the, dam, the, the berm that goes around the plant. This was a berm that was 3,500 foot long and was 25 feet high. It was built and revegetated with natural vegetation to keep the sound and the noise down from the plant. So these are what starts adding up costs. And the tunneled intakes, <clears throat> which we know also are, are very expensive. But in summary, I'll let you read this here, uh, but you know, we think that in a growing number of locations, desal uh, is a viable option. It's, it, it's, and we, we're, we don't think that, well, there are very few places outside of the Caribbean and the Middle East where you need all of your water supply to rely on desal, but uh, uh, some portion of it uh, certainly makes sense for most coastal communities. So with that, I will um, turn it over to the second speaker, who uh, is Sean Bothwell. He's a staff attorney with California Coastkeeper, and he was the lead environmental advocate for the State Water Board's desal policy that was just announced uh, just last week. Uh, what some very strict guidelines, that at they give the uh, development community a, a, a path forward for developing desal. He'll be followed by Bob Yamada. Bob is, uh, well, he, he's now the uh, Director of Water Resources Management for uh, San Diego County Water Authority, and he's uh, taken the lead for the authority in negotiating the water purchase agreement for the Carlsbad plant, and now is uh, making sure that the developer is sticking to the, uh, the agreement. And he'll be followed by Carl Seckel, who is the Assistant General Manager of the Municipal Water District of Orange County, who uh, is involved with the development of a plant here at Dana Point. So with that, we'll uh, turn it over to Sean. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Nice morning to be here. My name is Sean Bothwell. I'm the staff attorney for the California Coastkeeper Alliance. And uh, our organization represents 12 California water keepers statewide. Um, we pretty much have complete coverage from San Diego all the way to the Oregon coastline. Um, and here in Orange County, we have Gary Brown, the Orange County Coast Keeper. Um, his organization's been working for years now on the Huntington Beach uh, desal facility and also is, is a strong advocate for water recycling and has worked with many of you on water recycling projects. Um, I mostly work at the statewide level, um, specifically at the State Water Board. As Tom mentioned, for the last four years now, I've been working with the State Water Board on developing 
uh, the desalination policy that was adopted last week. And so what is our position when it comes to ocean desalination? Uh, we believe ocean desalination should be an option of last resort uh, due to its high energy demands, the cost to the rate payer, and the impacts to marine life. Um, and we believe it should only be pursued cautiously after con conservation, stormwater capture, and water recycling have been completely considered and, and, and used. And so I'll give you what, what does that mean exactly. You know, we look at water conservation, stormwater capture, and water recycling as the most multi-beneficial uh, water supply projects out there, the most cost-effective water supply projects for the ratepayer, for taxpayers out there. And we believe that those options should be pursued before we jump to desalination. And if it does come to that point where desalination is absolutely required, it should be done um, appropriately. It should be sited and sized appropriately so that you can accommodate subsurface intakes and, and be placed in a location where you can properly dilute the brine, whether it's with wastewater treatment or with high pressurized diffusers, as Tom discussed um, earlier. The example I like to give of the ideal situation for a desal facility, if one is needed, um, is the Calam example up in the Monterey region. And there, Calam and Monterey was required to reduce, reduce their reliance on the Carmel River. And so they first looked at conservation, and they, and they did their conservation, and they got their uh, per capita use down to 48.3 gallons per day, which is admirable conservation rate. Uh, they also looked at water recycling and are currently looking at a, a 3,500 acre foot per year um, water recycling project. And after they, they did that type of water supply management, um, they were able to size the desal facility appropriately, small enough so that they could accommodate subsurface intakes. And so the facility right now is proposing to use subsurface intakes and use the, uh, the treated wastewater for dilution of brine, which we see as the ideal way if you're going to do desal. Now, if you compare that to Huntington Beach, Poseidon, for example, you know, Poseidon comes in, they self-select the site they want, usually co-located with the power plant, they self-select the size that they want based on the economics and what will make them profitable. And then, you know, they force the technology to go with it. And we, we don't feel like that's the appropriate way um, to plan for desal going forward. So the good news is there are the alternatives that we think should be considered first. Um, there's potential for that growth. This is a little outdated of, of a chart, but it's from the 2010 uh, Department of Water Resources water plan. What it shows is the potential for new water supplies in California based on different water supply options. And as you can see from the far right, um, 3.1 acre feet of water, there's potential for that in water conservation. And um, sorry, moving down, water recycling is the second most, most abundant available supply out there. And if you look at the far left, there's ocean desalination at only 0.4 um, thousand acre feet per year. And so when, when you consider those, you, know, you can see that there's far more potential in the more cost-effective water supply options before we have to jump to desal. And if you look at other nations that have resorted to going to desalination, you look at their conservation rates. Um, they're well, all well below you know, uh, 100 gallons per day. Spain, Middle East, Australia. Usually their average is around 50 to 70 uh, gallons per capita today. And if you compare that with Southern California, you know, we're still at 186 on average for Southern California. So I think there's a lot more that Southern California can do um, to conserve water. Uh, when it comes to water recycling, Orange County's been, you know, an international leader on water recycling throughout the years. But there's still a lot more that can be done. And other communities are now looking to, you know, push the envelope. San Diego is looking at doing a surface water augmentation or a direct potable reuse project. Same with Santa Clara in the Bay Area. There's a lot more water recycling that can be done um, in Southern California. So I want to address the elephant in the room of California's ongoing drought, which is you know, a difficult thing to uh, create a desalination policy at the statewide board when we're facing such a drought, but we did. And I like to you know, warn, warn communities that we shouldn't be rushing to ocean desalination, and I use Australia as the example, and Tom already spoke to this, but um, you know, back in the 90s, early 2000s, Australia went into a 10-year pretty large drought and they decided to build six desalination facilities at a cost of $10 billion to the taxpayers. And you know, they, they took years to construct those facilities, and while they were constructing them, they did their water conservation, and the drought eased. And by the time they were constructed, um, three out of the six facilities uh, 
were no longer needed. They, they weren't producing any water. It wasn't cost effective to run those facilities, and they're now, moth, they're, they're now idle. And if you look at just one of those facilities, it still doesn't produce any water, but the, the taxpayers in that region are paying $678 million annually just for the operational and the construction cost of that facility. So second elephant in the room, or what everyone would like to talk about, is probably the Poseidon Huntington Beach project. Um, this is another kind of cautionary tale I, I would like to tell because, you know, the, the permits for Huntington Beach aren't done. They're, they're not complete. And in fact, the Poseidon Huntington Beach's Regional Water Board NPDES permit is only a temporary permit. They only have temporary, you know, permit status while the co-located power plant um, is using once through cooling water. And once they stop using once through cooling water by 2020, Poseidon Huntington Beach needs to come back to the Regional Water Board for a new NPDES permit, a full, complete NPDES permit. When they do that, the new desalination policy considers Poseidon Huntington Beach to be an expanded facility. And it, as an expanded facility, they will need to comply with all parts of the new desalination policy. This is a lot different than what's happening in Carlsbad. You know, Carlsbad, Poseidon, uh, is largely exempt from the new desalination policy. They really worked hard to get a lot of exemptions um, for the policy, but as the state board, you know, carved out different exemptions for Carlsbad, uh, they ratcheted up the, some of the restrictions for the rest of the desal facilities, including Huntington Beach. So what does the new desalination policy require Huntington Beach, some of the changes that will be, need to be made from the temporary permit to their permanent permit? Uh, first and most importantly, they're going to need to do a full and complete subsurface feasibility analysis study. Um, in their temporary permit, they were, they were permitted to use the ones through cooling water, so subsurface intakes weren't exactly fully assessed, um, but, but now it will be. And the Coastal Commission, in a separate process, has already looked at uh, the site that they're proposing and has seen that it's technically feasible to do subsurface at that location. So that leaves Poseidon with the option of arguing cost. And the way the policy um, is worded, they'll have to demonstrate that the project is just completely economically unviable um, if you use subsurface intakes. And from what Poseidon is proposing for you know, some of the profits that they're expecting, that's gonna be, I think that's going to be a tough bar for them to overcome. Um, siting. As I said, Poseidon you know, comes in, they self-select the site, they don't really do analysis of where the best site is for reducing marine life impacts. That's not true anymore with the desalination policy. They'll be required to assess alternative sites in the nearby area that would be better for accommodating subsurface intakes and maybe possibly even cheaper. Um, and then finally, brine dilution um, with seawater. Right now their permit allows them to dilute their brine with the, the co-located power plant. That's no longer allowed under the new desalination policy. Uh, brine dilution or flow augmentation um, is now prohibited other than for Carlsbad. And so when they go back to get their full permit, they're gonna have to look at either uh, diluting their brine with wastewater or put in high pressurized diffusers to dilute that brine, as, as Tom had mentioned earlier with one of the facilities. So in conclusion, um, I guess I will try to answer the question of the panel of is desal moving in the right direction? You know, you know, I think it depends on who you are and where you're located and what your interest might be, but if you look at Carlsbad Poseidon, I, I think based on the desalination policy, they're pretty happy. You know, largely they're exempt from doing the requirements. For new and expanded facilities, and specifically Huntington Beach, I don't know. There's a lot of questions now that need to be answered. I think before they thought, you know, everything was fairly wrapped up other than the Coastal Commission, but when they go back to get the permanent permit um, at the, the Regional Water Board, there's a lot of questions that need to be answered of whether they need to do subsurface intakes. I get asked a lot, um, you know, where will desal be in five, ten years? You know, will it increase? Will it... Will it stay the same? Will it lower? And I honestly believe that, you know, for the next five years, because of the drought mostly, we'll probably see a, a growth in desalination in California. But when we get to direct potable uh, reuse regulations, you know, we already have surface water regulations for recycled water. They'll be done in a year. Um, and we're moving towards DPR regulations in the state. And I, I honestly believe that once we get there, you know, why would we be continuing to do desal when we could do water recycling at a cheaper, cheaper cost um, and in a, in a more environmentally beneficial way. You know, I know Orange County Coastkeeper works a lot on water recycling, is very supportive of it. 
I've worked with uh, the water recycling industry at the statewide level to advance a lot of water recycling um, measures and bills at the state level, and you know, we are an ally when it comes to water recycling. And I just see that as a, a partnership that needs to be strengthened and will really increase water recycling in the future rather than us moving this push towards desal where you know, you're constantly in fights with whether it's environmentally protective or not. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and answer any questions anyone has uh, later. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about the Carlsbad experience. So if we could put that presentation up. Thank you. Um, the, there are a lot of analogies between what we're doing in San Diego County with the Carlsbad desalination project and uh, what's being considered here in Orange County, both in Huntington Beach and, in, uh, and at Dana Point. And so uh, as I go through this, uh, I hope to sort of connect the dots to some of the things that, that we've encountered and some of the, some of the lessons learned and some of the things that uh, you, you may want to consider as this process of considering seawater desalination for Orange County unfolds over the next couple of years. Now Carl Seckel over here assures me that this is a very sophisticated group, so I'm going to skip through some of these slides on the Water Authority and uh, really uh, talk about um, supply sustainability and reliability. I want to start there because, uh, as we all know, we want to employ resource strategies that are unique to local conditions. and um, and there's really not a single silver bullet here. It's desalination is not the silver bullet to all of our water uh, issues. And as we've heard uh, from the various speakers this morning, and really it's going to be a multifaceted approach that involves conservation, supply diversification. Uh, there are a number of infrastructure improvements that need to happen along the way. And dealing with periods of drought and dealing with, sh with managing through those shortages as, as the agencies in of Orange County are doing, as we're doing, uh, in San Diego County, Metropolitan is doing. One of the things that uh, Mr. Arakawa talked about this morning was the uh, 87 to 91 drought really being the impetus to uh, start down this road of supply diversification, meaning uh, we need to do all of the above, whether it's, whether it's conservation, whether it's recycling, whether it's desalination of groundwater or desalination of ocean water. Uh, whether it's shoring up our imported supplies, all of these things are necessary to stitch together a reliable water supply for our region. So uh, you can see through these pie charts what uh, we've been doing uh, in San Diego County in terms of diversifying that supply, adding new supplies, whether it's uh, uh, firming up imported supplies through the uh, Ir Imperial Irrigation District Transfer Agreement, whether it's uh, adding new recycling facilities, whether it's adding new groundwater desal facilities, and later this year, adding the largest desalination project in the Western Hemisphere. All these things are leading towards a diversified water supply portfolio. Um, I don't need to really talk about the, the reasons why we do desalination, and uh, I think they're pretty clear. Um, uh, probably the one that gets the most headlines is it's a drought-proof supply. I think one of the, the issues that's not talked about a, a, a lot is the stability that desalination brings to uh, the, the supply that ultimately is recycled. Uh, it's often said you can't conserve or recycle what you don't have. And so desalination brings a uh, water supply reliability to the source water that is ultimately recycled and used. And, and uh, for example, here in, in Orange County, the water that's recycled comes from somewhere. Much of it is, is uh, brought back through the system, but, much, but it also has to come in uh, from outside the area. And desalination brings stability to that water coming in. Um, the, the foundational document that really makes the, made the Carlsbad project go was a landmark water purchase agreement the, between the Water Authority and Poseidon. And that water purchase agreement was approved back in 2012, and it outlines the commercial and financial terms of that arrangement for the production and delivery of water. Um, at its, fundamentally, the document is a, it outlines a risk transfer. It's a risk transfer uh, from the from the uh, public agency to the private developer. So 
permitting, design liability, construction cost overruns, operations, all of those things have been, all those issues have been transferred, all those risks, if you will, have been transferred uh, to the private sector. Um, as we went through the process of, of leading up to the approval of the water purchase agreement back in 2012, there were a number of boxes that we needed to check. And I would say that for Orange County, for Huntington Beach or Dana Point, you're going to need to check the same boxes, which is confirm the timing and need for the facility, uh, go through the feasibility and engineering analyses, consider the unit cost as it relates to other alternative water supplies, uh, look at public and political support, uh, future energy prices are definitely consideration, uh, regulatory issues. Now we have some certainty, as, as Mr. Bothwell pointed out, with the uh, approval last week of the new desalination uh, regulations at the state level. That does definitely provides a certainty. Um, I, I'm going to uh, disagree with Sean, as we often do at different forums. Carlsbad does not have an exemption to the, the desal policy. There are some specific uh, uh, language in there that addresses Carlsbad, but Carlsbad will need to come into compliance with the new policy as we renew our permits and as the adjacent Encina power station shuts down. Uh, willingness to pay is another issue that uh, is important to consider, and then how does how does the project get delivered? So all let all boxes that we needed to check as we went through the process. I'm going to just focus on a couple of these pro, uh, uh, boxes, and one of them is public perception and support for desalination. And as you can see by these uh, pie charts, it really represent a longitudinal period of time. What we found was is that public support never wavered from about 80% for adding desalination uh, to our portfolio uh, over the last uh, 9 to 10 years. Now, th these, this last public opinion poll was taken in 2012, well before the drought really kind of kicked into the public's consciousness. So I would expect that that number might be even higher today than the 82% that it was uh, in 2012. One of the issues that uh, is obviously very important to water agencies as they consider new projects and new water supplies is what's the cost to the ratepayer and, and what are ratepayers willing to take on uh, as costs accumulate for different aspects of dealing with taking care of a water system and providing a reliable supply. What we found is that our uh, ratepayers were uh, uh, more than willing to take on an additional cost. And 58% of our respondents said we'd be willing to pay $5 more a month for a new desalination facility at Carlsbad. 68% said we'll pay something more. Uh, and so as we've gone through the math and the, and the uh, financial calculations, uh, the average rate payer in San Diego County, the average uh, residential customer, is going to pay $5 more a month for water from the Carlsbad desalination plant. Um, the, the key issue that I talked about here in terms of the responsibilities, Poseidon is permitting, designing, and building that facility. They're going to own and operate the facility. The Water Authority had to make some improvements to its system, uh, which we've completed, and uh, we agreed to a take or pay, a minimum purchase commitment of 48,000 acre feet per year from that project. We went through a lot of uh, scenarios, looked at a lot of different scenarios and projected supplies and, deba and demands, and we're comfortable with a minimum purchase uh, of 48,000 acre feet from year, per year from the plant. These are the cost of the facility in 2012 dollars. Uh, total cost comes in at just over a billion dollars. Uh, and uh, you see the, the costs um, uh, down at the bottom there. Those are the, the combined costs of the Water Authority's improvements plus the plant. If you just isolate the plant and the pipeline, in today's dollars, it's between about $1,900 and about $2,100 an acre foot for water produced from the facility. Now I'd like to get in, just show you some really quickly some, some photos from the construction and, and uh, just talk about the plant itself. Uh, it is a 50 million gallon per day facility, uh, as we've mentioned here already. It's going to be the largest and most advanced desalination facility in the Western Hemisphere, online by the fall of this year. Uh, I can't come online uh, fast enough. I think for all of us in San Diego County, we want to see that new water supply uh, coming, into our, uh, coming into our region and to our rate pairs. Um, the, the, the design of the facility is really based on uh, designs of facilities that, that Tom talked about earlier in Israel. We have a world-class contractor team uh, that's building the Carlsbad facility, Kiwit Shea Desalination, that includes IDE from Israel, who built 
uh, the uh, Ashkelon plant that Tom talked about, the Hadira plant, and the Sarek plant, three of the largest desalination facilities in the world. So the design is really an iteration of one that's been, that's been perfected over the last decade or so uh, in Israel. Uh, this, this schematic shows what happens to the water uh, once it's produced at the facility. It will go through a uh, new 10-mile welded steel pipeline, 54-inch welded steel pipeline. It will actually uh, meet our aqueduct system 10 miles to the east. Uh, we needed to reline an existing segment of one of our uh, aqueduct pipelines. It will blend with water at our uh, Twin Oaks Valley water treatment plant and then be distributed down uh, to basically all over the county to our customers. Uh, this is an aerial showing the, uh, the project and the pipelines and all the different improvement projects. As you can see, all of the water authority improvements are completed at this point. Uh, and uh, the desalination plant stands at 90% complete. Uh, and, the, and the pipeline is, I have a slide on the pipeline a little later. It's get, we're very close on the pipeline as well to being finished. Um, about 51,200 feet out of 53,000 feet is in the ground, and there's a focuses on a couple of areas where we had some tunnel construction, and uh, we're in the midst of restoring pavement on those streets that we were in, disrupting traffic for the last couple of years. Um, I mentioned 90% complete on the project. These are some shots of the, uh, of the project as it stands right now. We're through the major construction phase. We're into to, uh, commissioning and testing. And uh, again, we're looking forward to a fall uh, online date for this facility. Some of the design issues that, that went into the design and construction of this facility, you can see here, uh, we're going to be very interested once the water starts moving through the system and we look at some issues related to chloramine decay, which is a water quality issue that was identified with, uh, with water that has seawater as its source water. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, uh, key design features to this plant, uh, such as en the energy efficiency, and the use of state-of-the-art energy recovery technology that I'll talk about in a minute. And uh, specifically, this plant was designed to meet the Water Authority's specific water quality requirements. This is a shot that shows you what uh, the site looked like in September of 2013 and what it looked like back in March. You can see that the major, fa major facilities are all in place. Uh, one of the things that, for those of you that may at some point come and see this project, uh, it is probably one of the world's most compact desalination plants for its size. All of the, uh, the plant components basically fit on about six acres. And uh, you, will, you won't find that anywhere in the world. The facilities in Israel are on much larger sites than, than this project. So there was quite a bit of, of engineering and packaging that had to be done to, to make, this, make this site work. I mentioned state-of-the-art energy recovery. Uh, as opposed to what was in Santa Barbara earlier in terms of a, a turbine, we're now using uh, what's called isobaric pressure exchanger units. That and the bottom line here is that we're going to save about 30% of the power saving power that we would have needed uh, had we had we not had that technology. It powers about half of the feed water flow going into the reverse osmosis membranes. Uh, some sp some pictures, real briefly. Here's the uh, intake pump station. You can see uh, just adjacent to that crane standing up there, and some shots from the inside. These are the pretreatment filters. This is almost like a conventional water treatment plant with a, a meter of sand and a meter of anthracite that pre-filter the water. Uh, here is the uh, clear well dry well. This is the water that just where water gets pumped into the reverse osmosis system. Here's the reverse osmosis system, and you can the right-hand corner. That's one of the high-pressure pumps. Uh, this is the administration building. This is the product water tank. And uh, right adjacent to the uh, three blue surge tanks that you see there is the most important piece of equipment in the whole facility. That's the billing meter. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and you can see a close-up of the uh, product water pumps that pump the water up the hill 10 miles. Uh, it's a single lift, it, it, so we pressurize to about 500 PSI, so it's quite a, a high-pressure pipeline for the water authority. And you can see the inside of that uh, uh, product water tank. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Good morning. And you're going to get me loaded up here. Um, let, me, let me start out. I'm going to try to provide a little bit of a local 
flavor this morning, but I wanted to tie it back to what the speakers told us, because what we're trying to decide is ocean desalination going in the right direction, and I'm going to add on to the end of that, in Orange County. So we heard from Mr. Pankratz, who told us that technologically it's being done all over the world, it's not a big deal, we can do it. We heard from Sean, who told us we should do it carefully and thoughtfully. We heard from Bob Yamada, who said it's not a silver bullet, and I agree with that, and he is in the process of, of bringing on, and you saw him puff up, as he says, the largest plant in the Western Hemisphere. Um, at the same time, I'd like to note, uh, I, I was under the mistaken impression that there was a Poseidon session on this morning. Um, so I'm not, I wasn't brought on to speak about Poseidon per se, I was brought on to speak about Doheny. But I did want to put a little plug in for the Orange County Water District Board who um, last night took the next step in saying, we want to continue the discussions on the Poseidon Huntington Beach plant. So in Orange County, um, we actually have been looking at two plants for quite a while. I, I hate the statistic I'm going to throw out, but it's, it's uh, I've been looking at Doheny and Poseidon for 13 years now. So um, it's a horrible statistic, and my directors keep on asking, well, when's it going to get up and running? So I'm going to try to tell you a short story on Doheny as to why it's not up and running yet, but I think there's some, some good things coming up. Um, but um, I also wanted to reflect back and tie this back to some of the, the presentation that Mr. Arakawa gave earlier today about our imported supply reliability from MET. We have been very reliable from MET, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're having this debate in Orange County as to, um, and it's not whether we can, we're trying to make the decision, should we take that next step? So let me talk a little bit about Doheny. Um, this came about in an interesting statistic when Poseidon came knocking on our door in 2000 or 2001. We looked at Huntington Beach and we looked at South County and we said in South County there's actually a bigger need for supply reliability and we think it would be good if you looked down there. So Poseidon um, kicked around a little bit, took a look and said, no, we don't, we're not interested in pursuing a Doheny type project. Um, back then we called it the Dana Point project. And so they continued on with the Huntington Beach project. Well, our board was supportive of us looking at that. And so we, we kept on kicking the shoes and um, we progressed through a number of years. Uh, we applied under Met Seawater Desalination Program to get a incentive to it. Uh, we didn't have any decent data on it, so we went out and drilled some borings in 2004, built a test slant well in 2006, put a participants committee together in 2008, began operating a pilot plant and the slant well in 2010. We shut down that operation in 2012, and the, and the question is, and at that point, we wanted to go into the implementation, and we didn't quite get there, but Back to the question of why Doheny, uh, number one, you can see on the map there that um, Doheny or Dana Point is in South Orange County. It's many miles away from the Deemer filtration plant, which is their source of, uh, primary source of potable water for um, not only that area, but all of South County. It's about 90% dependent on that source. And so it's a high dependency. There are five fault lines that are in between uh, Doheny and uh, the Deemer plant, and so that reliability aspect was an important one. The other issues kind of fell into place. The, the land was already there. It's owned by South Coast Water District. There's a existing outfall uh, line that has sufficient capacity for the brine. The local pipelines to deliver the desal water are, are already there, so it's not a big deal for system integration. The geology is there. Uh, we didn't know it initially, but after we did more research, the geology there is for a slant well intake system, and there's many benefits from doing that. Instead of the pre-filtration that Mr. Yamada just showed you on their Carlsbad project, we use the natural uh, sands and gravels um, in the um, aquifer to filter the water. Um, uh, we also, uh, through the groundwater modeling aspect, determined that if we were to build a slant well intake system, it would actually have a protective effect to prevent seawater from being intruded into the groundwater basin and 
uh, the San Juan groundwater basin. So we did a lot of work on that project um, for um, a number of years. We came up with the concept of a 15 million gallon per day plant that was determined by the amount of water we could pull in through the slant wells. Um, that would meet 25% of the needs of the people. Uh, capital cost in 2012 was 150 million. The cost of the water, in including we put in an allowance for mitigating the impacts we would have on the groundwater basin down there was $1,611. So with all that good work, um, and we determined, uh, at least the staff reports we wrote, determined that it was uh, feasible in 2012, 2013, and we were outlining the steps to move forward. But we took a detour uh, at that point, and first comment on it is not all detours are necessarily bad, but there is a, a number of questions that um, we had answered, but as we went through there and checked off those answers, the agencies were still not quite ready to leap into that um, and um, might get into that in a follow-up question. But the agencies just weren't ready. And the last bullet on that slide talks about the San Juan um, groundwater basin. And the way I like to talk about the project, because this is at the interface between a groundwater basin and the ocean, and there's three boxes. One is the groundwater basin, and the question is, what can be done for the groundwater basin to produce more water out of there? What can be done to produce water out of the ocean? And then what do you do about that interface between that? And so there's, um, between 2012 and still going on today, there's a lot of work in evaluating what is the optimum? How can we manage that groundwater basin with uh, additional recycled water to produce an IPR project or a DPR project? But um, the my prognosis, prognosis here is that we will be successful. Uh, right now, South Coast Water District and Laguna Beach are looking at a smaller, maybe a 5 MGD project at that location, and I'm still hopeful that uh, the other agencies will come back in and it will be the regional project. Now, I threw a little curve at Mr. Pankratz today, and I didn't tell him I was bringing some friends along to the meeting. We're trying to decide if if uh, ocean desal is on the right path or not. So I decided that we needed a jury and I'd bring some of my jury friends along on this route. So I have um, 12 um, jury members and you need an alternate. So there's a 13th in there. But um, the purposes of a jury is to gather information and make a decision. And so that's what we're trying to do right now. So my first jury member is the reliability that we receive from Metropolitan, and Mr. Arakawa talked about that today. Now we pay for that reliability, we're paying about $1,000 an acre foot today for that water, and if we knew that Metropolitan was gonna be fully reliable out into the future, we wouldn't, probably wouldn't be making investments in ocean um, desalination, but Mr. Arakawa also talked about that partnership, and that partnership for keeping Meta and Southern California reliable actually demands that we do local projects, recycling, water use efficiency, and ocean desalination projects. So that's the first, first jury member. Second jury member was talked about um, in a couple different times with the uh, Farmer's Almanac, but climate change, and I, we're not in a four-year drought, and the drought didn't end today because of the rain, but I would make the argument that we're in the least, uh, we've been in out of eight out of the last 10 years, either locally, Colorado River or the State Water Project, we've been below average, and it's unknown if that will continue. And so if that is to continue, we're gonna certainly have to develop more water supplies. Third jury member is the State Water Resources Control Board and the recent action they took um, during emergencies. So if we had 20 ocean desalination plants along the coast today producing water in, the State Board still would have said, we don't care about your water supply, you need to cut. So they've taken the planning out of our hands. So if they've taken the planning out of our hands, I would suggest we don't need to do ocean desalination. We need to increase our water usage to get our baseline as high as possible. So the next time they want to cut, <laughs> it's a lot easier to do. The fourth, uh, fourth jury member I'll call Turf Wars. And uh, Turf is being um, viewed today as a bad actor. Uh, uh, by both the State Water Resources Control Board, um, but there's, there's other efforts. We do want to be efficient with our water use, and so there's an appropriate 
role for it, but the question is how far are we going to go, what impact will that have on our demands, and if we do that, make that, those type of investments, do we need additional reliability? Met storage accounts, Mr. Arakawa also talked about this, but it's, it's something we can't see. These storage accounts, groundwater basins, the storage is here, you can't point to it like you could an ocean desalination plant along the coast. And so it makes it visually hard to trust whether MET has uh, sufficient uh, capacity in their accounts. My argument would be that uh, based on what we know today, we should be upping those amounts. And along with upping the capacity of those, more importantly, you need to have the water to get into them. And so another issue that we don't really physically see is MET counts on transfers and exchanges and water banking to support um, us and our reliability. And I think the position by MET today is they wouldn't go out and invest in an ocean desalination plant and pay $2,000 an acre foot for it when they can go up in the Central Valley and pay two or $300 an acre foot for the water. Now they set a record this year by uh, purchasing water for about $800 an acre foot, but it's still less than ocean desal. So if we can make that work, do we need it? Um, elimination of wastewater outflows to the ocean. Um, that's uh, a goal in Orange County. Orange County should be complemented. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on, uh, in a complementary fashion, OCWD and Orange County Water District for having the goal of drying up the wastewater outflow in the northern part of the county. And there is work for the wastewater outflows in the south part of the county to pursue additional um, either purple pipe, uh, indirect potable, or or direct potable reuse to, to do that. So, um, and, and, and uh, eight, that was actually my eighth jury member is the, where we're going with IPR and DPR. The ninth one is earthquakes. I think to deal with earthquakes, I don't think we have adequate protection today. We're gonna need an additional storage and additional supplies. Frustration at the local level, you all probably feel that, or many in here do, and you wanna make a decision and make something happen. Water one, quad one, I hate to pull this in, but under the MET allocation principles, if we had a 50 MGD desal plant producing water today, we may only receive the benefit of 10% of that in an allocation. I won't get into the details, but it is a water wonk. I'm happy to deal with you afterwards. Twelfth jury member is OCWD. I already noted them um, and their influence uh, in, in the county. They are uh, suffering from um, lower flows in the Santa Ana uh, river, and we'll have to deal with that. And then the last jury member, because you always need an alternate, is Poseidon Resources, and they've had a lot of staying power, they've created a lot of friends, and a lot of, um, probably shouldn't use the word enemies, but uh, it's been a, been a tough battle, but they've had a lot of staying power, and they've been influential into what's happening in Orange County. So that's, that's the jury. Um, my conclusion here, I think the jury is still out. Now I'm doing uh, a little bit of advertising here for the Orange County Re Water Reliability Study, which MODOC is heading up with the water agencies in the county, and we're trying to take those 13 opportunities or jury members and decide what is the best course of action for Orange County. So I'll, I'll stop right there and be prepared for questions. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and I want to say one thing, you know, when you talk about California and desal in, outside of California, uh, the, the people always laugh about how long it's taken and 14 years for Carlsbad and 13 years. And, and I have to say that in, in looking at some of these other uh, desal initiatives uh, that, that have a diverse supply of water to choose from, it isn't so long, and I don't think it. I, I don't blame the regulators to the same extent that that many people do. Uh, it, it's been a very thoughtful process, and I think you've learned a lot with from some of the mistakes that were made. Well, I don't want to call them mistakes either. Some of the hurdles that and challenges that have faced uh, other uh, people, Tampa Bay Water, for instance. I mean, what uh, the the issues that they faced in trying to do a PPP on a large-scale infrastructure project was invaluable uh, to, the, to San Diego County Water Authority when they were trying to figure out. And I'm sure that the Huntington Beach people who've been considering this water purchase agreement also looked to some of the uh, problems. The, the planners looking at the size of these monstrous plants in Australia 
that were built as drought busters, well, you see what happens when it rains. You've got a big infrastructure, and, and it's just so expensive. I mean, it's just, it, it staggers the mind what the cost of that Melbourne plant is uh, because of all the things that they did and all the concessions they made to virtually every special interest group there was. I'm not saying you have to exclude those people. They were part of the process, but it just, it kept, it kept adding cost to it when putting a smaller plant closer to Melbourne to relieve the, to do some immediate, uh, relieve some of the immediate impact and help them get used to the fact and see how to approach it would have been, in, in hindsight, a, a pretty, uh, a much better way to go. But as they say down there, it's, uh, you know, it's, you don't know the value of water until you don't have any. And so they, they reacted pretty quickly. So that's a long way of saying that I think California has, uh, it, it's taken a long time, but I think you're going to have a lot to show for it with a balanced water portfolio, a thoughtful plan, and uh, this melded water rate that is that's tolerable. So um, anyway, with, with that little uh, speech, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to the, uh, to the, uh, the board members. Excuse me? Yeah, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask each of you all a question first. Uh, I, I wanted to uh, ask uh, Bob, now that you're 90% through with, uh, with the uh, Carlsbad project, what would have been done differently? Is there anything that, is, is there anything that, that, uh, that you've learned so far uh, that you'd care to share with us, or is it too early? One of the things that... Uh I uh, wanted to add that I didn't get a chance to mention in the presentation as we, as we uh, connect the dots and, and uh, compare the Carlsbad project to, say, a potential Huntington Beach project. Uh, I think uh, the experience with Carlsbad, uh, once the water purchase agreement was signed and we got going into design and construction, has been nothing short of fabulous. Uh, that project is on time, perhaps even ahead of schedule. Uh, and uh, on budget, and uh, um, the uh, uh, Poseidon and the contractor team have, have just done a terrific job. So from that perspective, I don't, I don't see um, a lot of things that, that we would have done uh, differently. The risk transfer has worked uh, according to as advertised, and so uh, uh, we're, we're not seeing those issues. Um, the, the, the process that got us to the water purchase agreement is another story. That was... A, as, as has been pointed out, a 14-year uh, uh, circuitous. Uh, what's the what's the, uh, uh, the the Beatles song? The long uh, long and winding, winding road. road. Well, this is exactly what uh, the Carlsbad process and it involved. Uh, not only uh, different points where the Water Authority and Poseidon were uh, working together and not working together. Uh, it also involved a six-year permitting process and 14 separate legal challenges. Uh, so if, if I could wind back the clock, if there are ways to, now that we have a, I think now that we have a, uh, a clear way forward in terms of uh, a state uh, a regulatory policy, that's going to help. Um, and I think uh, efforts to streamline the permitting process will also be helpful. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sean, let me ask you a question. As we've, we've all said uh, through our presentations, these projects are being done, most of them as PPPs or as public-private partnerships. And, you know, if you look around the world, even in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, uh, it, almost all large seawater desal projects are, are done as PPPs. They all look a little different, the, the structure of these PPPs, but I, I wanted to ask you, we, you didn't talk about that a whole lot. I heard the word profit come up a couple times, but what, what is your feeling or what, are the, what do you think about the PPPs? Just in a nutshell here. Yeah, I try not to get too involved in the issue of you know, public-private partnerships, um, but I think one of the negative sides of them is it does drive um, Poseidon-like projects where you know you pick a site, you pick a size based on the profit you want to make, not necessarily uh, the need of, of the region. And so if you look at projects that we would be more um, supportive of, those projects are done based on need of the area, not based on trying to make a profit. So I think that's all I'd say to that. No. Okay. Uh, Carl, just a, a quick question. In, in, Hun in Orange County here, is there room for two projects, Huntington Beach and Doheny? Uh, I mean, is, is if, 
Huntington Beach goes through, th does that have any impact on the, the, the uh, timeline for, for the second one or vice versa? Good question. Um, I think there is uh, potentially room for two. I think it goes back to evaluating our um, reliability off of the import system. And once again, if we see holes in that, then I think the what we want to look at those two plants is they are options that can be brought on to fill those holes. And so I think that's the part of the Orange County reliability study is where are the gaps, how do we fill those gaps. And so those plants, both those projects are potential gap fillers. Okay. Okay, well, with that, I think we'll see if there's any audience questions for any of the, uh, the panel members. Okay. Hi, thank you. My name is, my name is Larry McKinney. I have a question about the planning for technological change. So we keep hearing that we uh, are perhaps right on the cusp of major improvements in the cost effectiveness of the filtration that we're using. Maybe it's graphene membranes or something that could dramatically change the effectiveness of the process we're using. So my question is, are we on the cusp perhaps of a quantum change in the, in the effectiveness of the filtration? And if, if there are changes that are like that out there possible, how should we be including those considerations in the planning and decision making about these large capital investments? Well, I, if there's no objection, I'm going to try to take an answer to that. I, I write this weekly uh, newspaper that try, one of the things that I really focus on is some of these new technological changes that are going to make a quantum change and save 75% of the energy costs. And the short answer is, don't hold your breath. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff out there. There's a lot of uh, interesting science that's being done. Uh, and we'll inevitably see graphene in desal plants somewhere. But as far as it being a membrane, I don't think that there's, and, and I, in fact, a, as part of my research, I talked to the guy who won the Nobel Prize for it in the University of Manchester, Andre Geem, and asked him and what, what he thought. Uh, because his lab is doing a little bit of work on, on membranes. But we're a long way, we're a long way from that, and I, and I certainly don't think there, there's a quantum change. I think that these, we're, we're right now, the, the B-cell process is amazingly cost effective and efficient. It's, it's hard to, uh, in a short period, in two minutes and 23 seconds, to explain how efficient they really are, but it's, we're, we're within 25% of the uh, theoretical energy of minimum energy of separation. So we're, we're so close already to, to cost effectiveness. Now, there are ways to make plants more robust. There are better control systems to optimize energy usage. There's a lot of things. But graphene is way down the list as, as one example. Uh, and, and, but there's a lot of research being done that's, that's looking at that. Uh, I think the National Academy of Sciences also looked at that question specifically. <coughs> They looked at a 20-year horizon, and they couldn't identify anything. Uh, so I, I, that's a, anyway, next, next question, please. Let's go to this side of the room first. Oh, thank you. I'm, I wanted to know, um, this question, uh, first question is for Tom. Um, you said that uh, the Tampa Bay <clears throat> project was about $1,400 an acre foot. And I know uh, in Singapore has a... Uh, facility coming on, and I believe it's between seven and eight hundred an acre foot. And I'm just trying to get a range um, on those uh, plants worldwide. Um, if you could kind of give us a, a, the range for acre foot well, cost, and I know it's different because of the regulatory, but just ballpark kind of. Well, yeah, I, I would say that the, the range of seawater desal around the world, uh, the, the the range is probably somewhere in the. Uh, uh, thousand dollar an acre foot to uh, thirty five hundred dollars an acre foot that's just off the top of my head and let me say that the San Diego or the Singapore project bears no it, it doesn't bear any resemblance to reality uh, you know and 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 the well it's it's true I mean Singapore is is great at a lot of things and water planning and and water projects are are one of them but that project was done as they were negotiating uh, import water rate from Malaysia. And they were, they were putting that project in just simply to prove that if you don't give us the right rate, we'll do it ourselves and we won't, we'll turn off the spigot. 
So they put that in and they took some very liberal uh, uh, advantages of the way they calculated the cost. And they, they figured those plants, the, the, for instance, you talk about transferring risk. The Carlsbad plant, if they don't make some minimum quantity of water, that they, they have to pay a huge penalty. This, that plant is only required to make 25% of the capacity. So there's redundancy issues. There's just, it, it, isn't, com it doesn't reflect reality. I think 1,000 to 3,500 would be reasonable, and it depends upon how willing you are to step up and, and be responsible in terms of environmental mitigation methods, what your cost of energy is, how big the plant is, and on and on and on. Yeah, and I, my other question was um, <clears throat> to Carl. What I was wondering. Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay, Sorry. yeah, I, I was wondering, um, and it's also you know kind of to the Met, uh, which regard with regard to the system uh, integration and everything. Um, do we have any plans or policy or Carl? What are your thoughts on putting the you know aggressive uh, desal water into our uh, delivery system and the pipes? How we're going to mitigate that? Um, um, good, good question. Um, I put it in the category of, of technical. Um, we have very good, smart people that know the chemistry and the understand those issues. The experts are telling us as long as the water is stabilized, then there shouldn't be any problems with inter introducing that water back into the system. Um, just uh, during the meeting here, I leaned over to Bob and asked him that same question because they produce water at the ocean and pump it to their twin oaks, but in between they will have a couple of connections where they will be introducing that water directly to retail customers. So actually one of the things we'll do is look at, see how they do it. But we're discussing that with Metropolitan at this time, there have been study after study after study that says um, as long as you pay attention to the chemistry and do the stabilization of the water, make sure the pH is right, um, that you really shouldn't have any problems. Okay. And I've got two big red zeros here saying time is up, but you've been standing there, so... If Thank you. you. We could ask you to... Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to concentrate a little, if I could, on energy. Uh, we have a large energy output for the pumps to bring the water south to begin with. We've just taken the San Onofre offline. You're talking about Huntington Beach, which of course was a power plant, now is, now is no longer a power plant. Uh, all of this says to me you have a, an energy deficit and if we're gonna have a desal, where is our energy coming from? Additionally, two major lines come over through the Cleveland National Forest down in San Diego. They're only five miles apart. You guys always have fires up there. If the fire hits those two, two babies, we're out of luck down here. Uh, also, if you go to take a look at it, go to Powell, go to Mead, they're both down, great. What happens then when they go to Hoover? The pumps are not gonna be functioning there. So we've got an energy deficit across the whole West. Where is it going to come from? I, I guess we'll wait for the Orange County Energy Summit to address that <laughs> issue. I, I, <laughs> that's, that's, it's, a, it's a good, it's a good question. Was, I Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I think I've, our time is up here, so I'm sorry that we can't. Oh, well, it's, but, it's all right. Okay. I'll leave you with that. Thank <laughs> <Okay>. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next time. <laughs>